Welcome to the Maranatha Bible Class with Bible teacher Bob Suriano. Hello friends, good to have you with us again today. We are going to be picking up in the book of Revelation in chapter 8. Today we're going to be dealing with chapter 8 and there's some uh, tremendous, amazing things that happen in chapter 8. And I'm going to be playing a couple of short video clips that I prepared just for this chapter uh, that I believe are going to help you understand what scripture is talking about and referring to in here so i want to jump right in if you have your bibles i'll be reading from the king james version today uh, this is revelation chapter 8 starting with verse 1 and this is what scripture says and when he had opened the seventh seal again this is jesus having the scroll with the seven seals and he's opening now the seventh seal. So this will be the last seal uh, during the Great Tribulation period. And scripture says, And there was silence in heaven about the space of a half an hour. For about 30 minutes. Now you have to realize, this is the only time ever recorded in scripture. This may be the only time ever we don't really know that for sure but at least what scripture is telling us here uh, and from what we know in all the rest of scripture this is the only time that this takes place in heaven that for 30 minutes there's complete silence and we know from scripture that whoever is uh, been to heaven like John uh, standing before the throne uh, all the other writers like Isaiah Ezekiel uh, the Apostle Paul, anybody else that has seen heaven or been there uh, says that it's, there's constant praise and worship and, and rejoicing in, in, in front of uh, uh, the throne of God. But here there's absolute silence. Verse 2 tells us this, And I saw the seven angels which stood before God and to them were given seven trumpets. So now the next series of God's wrath is about to be unleashed on the earth. The seven seals are finished. Now it goes into the seven trumpets. Verse 3, And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer. Now this censer, the only way that we could probably relate to this is what we see here on earth and in some traditional uh, religions, I'll say it that way, uh, they have these big censers that they carry and incense, incense is burning in it and smoke is coming out. I'm putting a picture up on the screen so you can see what I'm talking about. That may be what John is seeing here. And there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayer of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. So now here is something that I want to give you a little bit of comfort and reassurance that 
the saints that are already there. That's not what this is referring to. This is referring to the saints that are still here on earth during this time that their prayers are coming up before, before God. This is reassurance to us that right now, today, where we're at, and this is February uh, uh, 2023, that while we're still living here on this earth, and when you pray, if your heart and your, you have a right relationship with God, He hears your prayers. Your prayers go to heaven. If you're unsaved and you're not in a right relationship with God and you're praying to God and it's not a prayer of repentance, God doesn't hear your prayers. So you have to be in a right relationship with the Lord and you have to have a clean heart, clean mind. Doesn't mean you're a perfect person, but it means that you have to have what's called uh, in the Bible a born again experience where you are born uh, the old man dies, the old man of sin dies, and the new man is born again. And that is the process where we trust Jesus. We believe that God sent him to die in our place on the cross, and that he suffered and died for us, and that he was buried in a grave, and that he rose on the third day, and then eventually he ascended back to heaven where he sits at the right hand of God. If we believe that he came and died for us and that he paid the penalty for sin for us, then what we have is a true born again experience, it's a spiritual birth. Uh, then we have access to the Lord. When, when, when we pray, our prayers go up, God hears them, and God answers our prayers. Now, it's not always according to our timetable, and most of us, like myself, we get impatient. We want God to act right now. We want him to move as soon as we pray. We want the answer to come. But we don't foresee everything that is coming down the road. We don't see all the obstacles, all the other things that could, could happen. And it doesn't always line up with what we want, with what God wants, and what God's will for our life is. So it's very important that we trust God that he's got everything under control, and that in due time, he will answer the prayer according to his purpose, his plan, his righteousness, and everything will work out just right. Hallelujah. All right, verse 4. And the smoke, and the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. Verse 5, And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it to the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and earthquake and earthquakes. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. So what the the censer that was filled with fire and, and alt, uh, of the altar and was cast to the earth, what do you think that that represented? Uh, I, I tend to have the, the belief that God has now heard the prayers of all the saints here on earth and the censer that is taken and thrown down to the earth is God's about to move on the behalf of those saints. God's about to answer and God is about to pour out his wrath upon mankind, wicked mankind. Uh, that's, that's what I, I take from that. Uh, I'm not sure how you would read that and understand that, and there could be some different interpretations, but I like to go with Scripture, and I think when you put all the Scriptures together, the prayers, the censer, are all combined with the incense, and God is now about to answer the call of all these other saints. Hallelujah. All right, verse 7. The first angel sounded. you got to remember, they have a trumpet. Now, what, what does the trumpet look like? There could be a couple of different opinions on that. The trumpet could be something like this here. And hopefully you can, you can see this. This is kind of a really long trumpet, and I can't really begin to play this. But I'll try to at least blow something out. <laughs> Terrible. 
but that it could be a trumpet of that nature or it could be a traditional shofar which is one of these and this is a shofar and I'll try to to blow in this as well blow that one a lot, lot better. We don't know exactly what they will be blowing, whether it's some type of a metal or a horn or, or whatever, and that's really not important, but the Bible says that uh, they're going to be blowing a trumpet. It's going to sound, and in verse 7, it says this, the first angel sounded, and there followed hell, and fire mingled with blood. Now the I'm going to stop right there because the only other place in Scripture that we can find something similar to this was when Moses and Aaron went to Egypt to Pharaoh and they told Pharaoh from the Lord to let his people go. And we know that different plagues came uh, upon uh, ancient Egypt and it was meant to let those people know that God was going to do even worse things if they didn't obey his voice and his two servants, Moses and Aaron. So fire uh, mingled with, uh, hail came down with fire, uh, was not mingled with blood, but it was similar to what we see here. Now this is gonna be adding one, one more ingredient, which would be the blood. And if you've ever been around a storm, a thunderstorm where hell came down. And I've been in a few hell storms and they are, they're, they're pretty terrifying. And the bigger the hell stones get, the more terrifying it is. And we're gonna see that in scripture, uh, at a certain point, there's gonna be hell stones that will fall from the heavens that are gonna weigh 100 pounds. Now I know that I think the biggest that we've had on earth that anyone's ever recorded were a softball size or a little bit bigger and those probably weigh a, a pound or two but could you imagine a hundred pound hell, hell, uh, hell ball uh, coming down and falling upon somebody and it will kill people when it hits them. It's going to be absolutely terrible. But here we have hell falling from the skies and fire mingled together. Now that, that is a combination that in the natural does, does not work because hail is frozen ice and then fire of course is hot. So when you put fire and ice together it melts, it would melt it. But here they're both going to be existing at the same time which is going to be baffling enough as it is and it's a sign again to people that judgment and wrath is coming and people better wake up, they better repent and get right with God before it's too late. Now verse 7 continues and goes on and says this, and they were cast upon the earth and a third part of the trees were burnt up and all green grass was burnt up. So now, now we see that from the, the hell falling and with the fire mixed with it, it's going to burn up one third of all the trees that exist on the earth. That's a lot of trees. And I know that, you know, where I live here in Georgia, uh, we have massive amounts of trees here. And uh, that's one of the things that a lot of people, when they come and they pass through, they visit the Atlanta area, they always compliment how beautiful the trees are here in Atlanta. We have a lot of pine trees, of course, which to me are not pretty, but we have a lot of oaks, we have maples, we have poplar trees, we have all kinds of trees, but generally the, the big beautiful oaks and maples and um, sycamore trees, they're just absolutely gorgeous among all the others. But you just think about that, a third part of all the trees are gonna be burnt up and all the grass will literally be burnt up. So anything that's green, for the most part, is going to be destroyed. It's going to be a, a horrible time just to go out and look at nature. Verse 8 says this, And the second angel sounded, and as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and a third part of the sea became blood. 
So now we have something that's very interesting here, folks. We have what appears to be a mountain, something very huge that is coming from the sky, burning, it's on fire, and it was cast into the ocean. Now it doesn't tell us where in the ocean this comes, but when it does hit, it literally kills a third part of the sea. So that would be the fish and the um, any kind of an a animal life in the ocean. A third part of that is immediately going to die. And the blood there, uh, I think it really is going to uh, refer to a poison that is going to kill these fish and then they will bleed out, which will cause the ocean or the, the sea at that, in that particular area wherever it may be is going to turn red like blood and it most likely will be the blood of the fish that is just coming out and resting on top of the water so this alone is going to be a very disturbing um, sight now we're going to watch a video here in just a few minutes but i want to read a couple more verses verse 9 says this and the third part of the creatures that were in the sea and had life died and a third part of the ships were destroyed so now you're thinking about this huge mountain on fire comes crashing down to the earth hits someplace in in the ocean kills a lot of the the wildlife in the ocean and then a third part of the ship so whatever ships were in the ocean at that time and whatever that number is a third of them are going to be destroyed so you might think well how in the world can that happen well it's really pretty simple when we think about things today and um, scientific things that we've seen today for instance when a great earthquake hits a certain area or region of the world and there's a mountain that collapses and falls into the ocean it causes a tsunami and tsunamis uh, from earthquakes on islands in the in the sea they can move at a very rapid speed i believe up to 500 miles an hour maybe even faster and we know this from that great tsunami that took place i believe it was on christmas eve 2004 in uh, some of the tropical islands and there was over 200,000 people that were killed from that tsunami and they, they said that the waves came in at 500 miles an hour it, it just went out in all different directions and did massive damage property damage but more impro more important than the property damage was the loss of, of human life so verse 10 says this and the third angel sounded and there fell a great star from heaven so now there's something else coming from heaven burning as it were a lamp so now this thing's on fire and it's so bright it's like a lamp and it fell upon a third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of water so now we have the oceans uh, being uh, polluted now we have fresh water being polluted from whatever falls from the sky verse 11 gives us a key it says this and the name of the star is called wormwood now i'm going to put up on the screen here all the places in scripture where it talks about wormwood i'm going to put up the greek definition of wormwood and basically what wormwood in a nutshell what it means is is bitterness um, it, it's something that causes disaster uh, calamity would be probably one of the best ways you can describe it uh, and it is something that is going to affect a third part of the waters it's going to poison the waters where you can't drink fresh water and this is going to be something that's going to be very terrible and verse 11 goes on and says this in a third part of the waters become wormwood and many men died because of the waters because they were made bitter and that means they can't drink it um, it would be like trying to drink salt water you, you can't you can't drink salt water and survive 
Um, it would make you thirstier and thirstier. This will be worse than trying to drink salt water. So it's a very, very terrible situation. Now, I want to share this with you. I'm going to let you watch this video because it will explain what this possibly could be better than what I can really relate to, other than telling you that there has been an increase over the last couple of years, and I don't know if you've noticed this, but in uh, uh, asteroids making really close passes by the Earth. Some of them have burned up and, and hit the Earth, but some of them have missed the Earth, and some of them have been all different sizes. But I've noticed from all different types of newspaper articles, internet articles, it's everywhere that there are, there's an escalation, if I could say it that way, in asteroids, mostly just asteroids, not meteorites, but asteroids coming very, very close to Earth. And there is one that is predicted to come so close to the Earth that half the science, scientists say it will miss us, but just barely. The other half of scientists say it's very probable that it's going to hit the Earth. The area where some scientists believe it's going to hit uh, is off the shore of California. And if it hits there, the tsunamis, the earthquakes that it will trigger could be catastrophic. There is the uh, what's known as the Cascade Volcano, Volcanic Run that runs up through that area all the way up into uh, Canada. Some believe that it could trigger all those volcanoes to erupt at the same time. We know that the San Andreas Fault and some other faults are right there, that it could literally cause massive earthquakes in that area, but it, 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 it could very possibly hit in that area. Now, I'm not saying it is. I'm just saying that their scientists are split on this. NASA originally had predicted a hit on Friday the 13th, 2029. And it is, it is coming. It is due to at least pass by the Earth on Friday the 13th, 2029. Nobody disagrees with that. Even the scientists that say that it's not going to hit the Earth, they say it's going to come so close that it will literally wipe out all our satellites. So whatever our satellites do for us and give us will be gone on Friday the 13th, 2029. There's also a lot more information, but I want you to watch this video. This is a former um, Assembly of God pastor that had uh, some dreams, uh, like the, uh, the uh, book of Joel tells us that in the last days your young men shall uh, see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Well, this gentleman seen a dream and uh, I'm going to let him explain it. This is a, new, uh, a clip off of CBN News where they interviewed him about a book that he wrote called Wormwood. And uh, I will tell you this, that the, that the asteroid that is predicted to possibly hit the Earth, the name of that uh, asteroid is Apophis. In Apophis, and they specifically named it, the scientists that seen it, to, to represent the god, one of the one of the gods of Egypt, uh, his name was Apophis, and it was known as the god of chaos and destruction. I just think that's kind of weird, and also that god represented had a body form of a serpent, which I thought also is extremely odd. But you watch this video; it's about nine minutes long, and then we will be back. killer asteroid be hurling towards Earth? If so, does the government know about it? And what does the president's new Space Force have to do with it? Take a look. Thomas Horn is a prolific author and the CEO and co-host of Skywatch TV, known for in-depth reporting on prophecy, conspiracies, and the supernatural. 
His recent research covers a subject he says is strange and scary. And it is going to shake the public to the bone. The Wormwood Prophecy is Horn's latest book, which thoroughly examines Bible prophecy, a known asteroid, and the impact it could have on all of us. Please welcome to the 700 Club the author of The Wormwood Prophecy, Thomas Horn. It's nice to have you here. Good to be here. Thank you. Talk a little bit, if you will, about the dream you had last year about an asteroid. Yeah, so well, it was the most vivid uh, dream that I've ever had. It, it, it was frankly frightening. I'm sure. I found myself on a mountain running with thousands of other people and an asteroid descending down towards the Earth. Um, and, uh, but when I woke from that dream, and by the way, I have a history with this that goes back to when I died uh, many years ago and my wife found me dead, no heartbeat, no pulse. She tried to resuscitate me and that at the same time, I saw myself standing in front of a brilliant light somewhere. Mm. Uh, somehow in my mind, I knew that I was standing before God. I knew that he had told me some things and then said, you're not going to remember. And he sent me back. And through my life, several times, incidents have happened uh, in which I go to bed, I go back to that place, I see things. When I wake up, I write them down. And so far, they have come to pass every time. Uh, and I've talked about them publicly, so it's been verified that I pre-saw these events. Well, this was the same thing. Went to bed, woke up in this place, this terrible uh, strike on Earth with, a, with an asteroid. But when I woke up from that vision, uh, set up in bed, in fact, I almost fell out of bed, uh, and a single word seemed to be whispered through my bedroom, and that was the word apophis. Now... I knew that there was an ancient Egyptian god of chaos, a chaos dragon, the enemy of light, called Apophis. Um, I also knew that NASA had named a particular asteroid Apophis. Interesting. But I didn't know anything about it, so when I got out of bed, I went to my computer and I started immediately doing research into the asteroid Apophis. One thing led to the other. Ultimately, it led to the writing of the book, and I became convinced that NASA and other international space agencies are involved in a cover-up. How did you link this to Revelation 8? What was the connection there? Uh, well, Revelation 8 describes, actually, the, the, the first four of the trumpet judgments seem to be describing the different uh, aspects of a singular event. The first one describes fire falling down from the heavens, catching the fields and trees on fire, which is exactly what would precede the incoming of a giant asteroid, the uh, incoming debris. The second one describes uh, what appears to be a burning mountain that falls into the ocean and wipes out ships. This is the first part of a, of a giant rock that's breaking apart as it's entering space. But the third one, it calls wormwood. And this too is like a giant mountain burning like a lamp that falls down. In fact, the Greek word there, a star fell from heaven. The word star is astron, an asteroid fell from heaven. Uh, and it has the um, effect of poisoning a third of the earth's water. And then the fourth trumpet, the sun, the moon, the stars are a third part blacked out, which is exactly what would happen with all the debris kicked up into the atmosphere from the impact of a giant asteroid. President Trump has a newly formed space force, I guess it's called. What, what's the cover-up that you think is involved in all of this? Well, I don't think Donald Trump is involved in a cover-up, but I do think he is surrounded by a faith community, and many of those are prophecy believers, and he has wisely allowed his ear to be attuned to some of the things they are telling them. And I'm, I know some of these people, and I've been told that they were whispering in his ears about Apophis as potentially being the Wormwood mm -hmm. asteroid of Revelation uh, chapter 8. I also note that as soon as they launched the Space Force, the, the primary reason of the Space Force is mitigation of near-Earth asteroids. So it's directly connected to this uh, effort to defend the planet. Um, but uh, I noticed that the first thing they did was they dedicated a King James Bible at the National Cathedral, and all commanding officers in the new Space Force have to put their hand on that particular Bible uh, in order to be sworn in to duty for office. So they, too, it appears to be um, recognizing, right, that there's a spiritual 
dynamic to this. You go in, we're touching the surface of this, you go into a great deal of the scientific aspect of all of this, but you say really that it's not possible to mitigate some of these asteroids because of the si size that they are. I mean, it, there's nothing that, that really can be done to. That's right. Well, uh, uh, Apophis, for instance, is the one that I focus on in the book. It was discovered in 2004 at the Kitt Peak National Observatory. And at the time, NASA and their NEOWISE team felt that it did have um, enough of a risk of impacting the Earth. And by the way, of all dates, Friday the 13th, right, April 2029, so nine years from right now. And so they began doing studies around it. Eventually, though, they changed their mind. They said it's going to come very close to the Earth, but it's not going to hit the Earth, except I talked to one of my friends at NASA and another gentleman at uh, the Pentagon that Colonel McGinnis put me in contact with, an impact specialist, and they said, if you look at what NASA is saying, they're saying that in 2029 it's going to come so close to the Earth, Apophis is, that it's going to take out the satellites that are in orbit around this planet. And they're the ones that are saying you can't possibly say that a rock this big, traveling 28,000 miles per hour, weighs a, an estimated 20 million metric tons. If it hit the Earth, it's going to be equivalent to 65,000 of the bombs that we dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki at the end of World War II. It could literally crack the mantle of the Earth. They're saying that that traveling through tens of thousands of miles of space could all kinds of things, other debris could deflect its uh, trajectory. Uh, and I believe that it is set to impact the world. Wow. In 2029. That's just a little bit of what's in Thomas Horton's book. It's the Wormwood Prophecy. Thomas, talk to me a little bit about what people can do with regard to this. If something so big could be so catastrophic and can't really be mitigated, but could by other means be accidentally move off force close to the earth or off course close to the earth, what do we do? Well, first of all, uh, MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, published a paper just last week in which they said Apophis is a greater concern that is being admitted. There are top 100 scientists that say NASA really? is involved in a cover-up with regard to this. But what can Christians do? Well, one thing, we can use it as an opportunity because if it does turn out to be wormwood, which is what I personally believe, we can use it as an opportunity to to preach the eminency of the second coming of Jesus Christ because this would be what dispensationalists would call a mid-tribulation event, right? So the second coming could be closer than what most people realize. The other thing is God himself can mitigate what man cannot. Yeah. And in the Bible, there is a pattern where it says that these judgments are going to come. You can see Jonah going up and down the streets of Nineveh, right? Mm -hmm. This judgment is coming, but when from the pauper to the king they repented in sackcloth and ashes, God delayed that judgment from coming against uh, Nineveh. So we do know that there's a pattern in Scripture in which if Christians will pray, use this as an opportunity to point people to Jesus Christ, use it as an opportunity to preach the gospel, and that opportunity is going to increase because it, in five years from now, people with just semi-commercial telescopes are going to be able to look up into space and see it coming. Wow. You want to read it? It's called The Wormwood Prophecy. And so thank you, Thomas Horn, the author, for being with us, Dr. Thomas Horn. All right, folks. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that video. I, I would recommend that book, that if you're interested in learning more about this, uh, there's the book Wormwood. He wrote two other books after that dealing with the same subject. Uh, but I would recommend that book if you're interested to dive a little bit deeper and getting a little bit more knowledge. Now, folks, this is not to scare you. If you're a child of God, if you're a born-again believer, you won't be here during that time. But now, if, if you have unsaved loved ones and you can use this as a possible way to witness to somebody, then and if it scares them where well, they don't want to be here, then you basically would just lead them to say, well, look, you can escape all these things that are coming upon the earth. All you have to do is just trust in the Lord and, and ask him and invite him to come into your heart. So in that, we should use Bible prophecy as a witnessing tool and as an evangelistic tool to reach the lost. So, anyway, we're going to pick up with verse 12. And the fourth angel sounded, 
and the third part of the sun was smitten and the third part of the moon and the third part of the stars so that the third part of them was darkened and the day shone not for a third part of it and the night likewise so now we have complete darkness coming uh, now it's possible and I'm just saying it's possible if these asteroids hit and cause volcanic eruptions and if there's many volcanoes that erupt at the same time this could be par possibly what causes the darkness what causes the Sun to, to break through all the ash clouds it's possible that that's tied in but then again this could be just totally a different uh, plague and judgment that God puts on where he does all this separately and darkens all these things verse 13 and I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice now here's an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying woe 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 to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound so now here's an angel flying through heaven saying woe 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 there woe to the inhabitants of the earth because the other three angels have yet to sound uh, their judgments and I wanted to share this with you do you know that in the Bible there's 107 verses that use the word woe and uh, th they're used this way woe for disaster woe to Israel and Jerusalem woe to the rich and woe to the wicked and those 107 times are used in Scripture uh, and that's uh, it's 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 very powerful when you read and you read in Isaiah 5 and where it says woe uh, and and other places in Scripture you know that God is is saying something that's going to cause judgment and perhaps his wrath to be poured out on somebody so folks this completes chapter 8 and I again I don't want Christians to be upset by this this is coming whether we want it whether we want it or not this is God's plan to judge the earth for its wickedness and it's going to hopefully bring a lot of people into the kingdom of God so if you have loved ones witness to, witness to them don't delay that pray that the Holy Spirit anoints you to be a, a voice and that your light and that you are salt to them to make them thirsty for the things of God and folks I've said this for many years if you can do anything for Christ you better do it now because we are running out of time and uh, you just got to do what you got to do for Christ you got to do it now so folks until next time God bless you have a great day and we'll see you in chapter 9